You guys have all the answers, huh? I knew it. I knew you guys were too smart. You guys asked a lot of good questions in the beginning class, so that's probably why. You guys are all quiet. It could be technical. It could be industry-based. Oh, I heard someone be brave. Who is that person? Yeah, so I made a list of questions beforehand. So, um, <laughs> so you came real prepared. Good job. Yeah, so I mean, uh, okay. So my first question was, uh, how can we have actionable, specific, and measurable goals? How, how come? What do you mean? How can we? Or how can we? Or how, what would you recommend? Um, let me ask you, like, what in, in one co what, what context are you asking this question? I guess um, looking at a way to like monitor my progress or really be kind of real with myself in terms of like my weaknesses and like what I'm trying to do as far as like okay. job or portfolio and stuff like that. Because sometimes I feel like in the past I just like draw and say I'm getting better, but I'm just like drawing the things I'm comfortable with and maybe not really improving as fast as I could. I understand. Okay. So that's a, that's a pretty good question. So um, I, ha I have a friend who I'm teaching how to draw and I was talking about him earlier when I was talking about like proportions and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. And one of the things that we talk about a lot, because he's talking to me is like, you know, so do you think I can actually be an artist? Like, you think that's possible? And I'm like, oh, yeah, of course you can. I think so. And and uh, he was just like, all right, well, what do we need to do? Like, how how am I going to do this? You know, I was like, the first step that you need to do is to realize that being good at art is quantifiable. Okay. Okay. And what do I mean by this? Like quantifiable. What I mean is that it's measurable, right? We can measure how we can be good at art and we can measure what we're doing that makes us better at it and what makes us worse at it, okay? These are all measurable. You know, there's a real problem in the art community and outside, especially outside of the art community, that this idea of art is like a God-given gift, right? Yeah. I don't think most of you guys don't fall into that trap entirely but it still exists, okay? Yeah. And I said, if you can start off the gate or out of the gate without that preconceived notion, you're gonna do great. You're gonna do amazing, right? If you understand that art can be quantifiable and measurable, all that stuff. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Because the human brain is a freaking physical thing. It's just the human construct that we've called it as a mental thing, right? Yeah. Like there's a difference between our mental and our physical. No, our brain firing off its neurons is physical. It's a physical thing. Good example of this, there's no question if I take a hammer to your arm, I would break your arm because it's a physical thing. It's affected by physics and physical things, right? Yeah. If I take a hammer to your brain, it's going to break your brain. <laughs> it's not going to all of a sudden do something different. It's going to do the same thing. It's just going to be smashed up. That's why we have a large skull. We've evolved to have a larger skull because our brain is highly important. Without it, we don't function. You know? Yeah. And so once you understand this, which I think most people do, especially at a very at a principle level, like I just demonstrated, right? Mm-hmm then you can understand that this idea of being good at art is also a physical thing. It's a physical activity. Okay. And just like many physical activities, you can get good at them with practice, right? Like if you want to get good at throwing a three pointer, what do you got to do? Got to practice shooting three pointers, you know? Yeah. And you got to do it constantly and consistently, you know? And then like I mentioned before, if you just not just to do that, you have to compound it. You have to research, study, analyze right 
to yeah. really give your brain all the tools it needs to be able to make you the most effective three point shooter you can possibly be. Right. Uh, I remember watching this uh, esports player talking about Counter Strike, and he was talking about how fire rates of different weapons and how you should shoot them. He was saying, you know, when you're shooting an AK 47, he says, when it first shoots, it's pretty accurate. Like the first few bullets will fire accurately, as I'm demonstrating with these little black spots I'm drawing, right? He says, but after like a half a second or so, the bullets start to shoot. I forget exactly which direction, but I'm just going to demonstrate this still. He said, the bullets start to shoot up and erratically, right? Mm -hmm. But he says, right around this moment, it's still pretty accurate. So the first round of bullets are accurate, and then right after the half a second, they're accurate still, and then any longer, then it starts to get really erratic. Okay, so there's like three stages. Accurate, uh, offset, but still accurate, and then completely offset it and inaccurate, right? And so he was saying what you got to do is on the first stage, obviously aim for the head. You're aiming for the person's head, right? And then after the half a second, he says, you got to feel it. You start aiming down towards like their, their crotch area, right? Because then you're still going to be accurate. You're going to still be shooting towards their head because you're correcting for the offset. And he says, and then once you've done that, you have to reset. Stop pulling the trigger. Stop pulling the trigger. And do it again. So that you have maximum amount of accuracy and f- rates of bullets. Because it's better not to just burst fire. It's better to hold the trigger down and just have it constantly on the right target. Right? Why am I talking about like Counter-Strike AK-47s, how to shoot them? Because it demonstrates that he's beyond just practice. He's knows he's an extremely knowledgeable, knowledgeable player. And because of that extra knowledge, it makes him that much better than you and me. You understand? That makes sense. And, and this is the same with art. Like if you know anatomy, like if you know the difference between human anatomy and a horse anatomy, right? That's going to help you, right? So it's not just about practice. It's all quantifiable and measurable. You can measure whether you know these things or not. You understand? Yeah. You can measure if you can draw a straight line or not. You know? That's Mm -hmm. measurable. You can see it for yourself. You can, and then you can challenge and test yourself. So now let's, now let's get to the more pragmatic and more practical advice. Okay. The ones that will get you moving the action oriented advice. Okay. All I just gave you uh, was to plant a framework of thinking so that way you don't get confused with what I'm about to tell you, tell you now, right? Or you, you can now understand why I'm about to tell you what I'm about to tell you, okay? Okay. So timing yourself is one of my favorite things to do because you've given yourself a time limit. If you give yourself 60 minutes to, let's say, paint a complete painting and it's like, I don't know, like 70% good like or cool, whatever that actually means in this instance, I'm just going to keep it you know, abstract for now, but let's just say it gets like 70%, like maybe the materials weren't rendered. Maybe you didn't get the full character drawn out, all sorts of stuff. Right. So then, well, how do you know you've gotten better then if you do it again, what do you have to do? What, what variable should stay the same time, right? Yeah. You shouldn't change the time because if you, let's say gave yourself 10 more minutes, then you've, you've, you don't have an accurate, and it's like 75% better, you, you don't know if that extra 10 minutes actually helped or made it worse. You don't really know because you changed too many variables. But if you do it again in 60 minutes, and let's say it's at 70% still, then whatever you did in between the, the first time you did it, like whatever was going on in this time, right? Mm-hmm. Like whatever you're studying or whatever you're practicing might have, might have not been effective. Okay? Yeah. So you, the next time you try something different, you study something different, right? And you test again. And then what? Look what happens. Now it's 70%, 71% better. Or you see a little, you see improvement. Maybe you finished the complete figure, but the materials are still not indicated. So then you do it again and again and again and again. And do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. This one thing has not changed. And so that way you can constantly engage what you're improving on and what you're not, and you can see what's helping you, what's not helping you. 
or maybe you're not prepared. Maybe the things that you've like someone giving you advice on how to study this specific type of thing, you tried it and it doesn't seem to stick with you. There's a, there's a variable to consider that you're just not at that stage of understanding, right? And maybe you should come back to that practice when you feel like it makes more relevance, you know? Like there could be a piece of advice that would work for somebody that's a little bit more advanced, but not for someone who's super novice. You understand? Yeah. So you have to keep those types of things in, in line. So the, what you gotta do is you gotta make variables and you have to keep things consistent. So that way you can quantifiably see what's working, what's not working. Does this all make sense? So yeah. then, then you can see how you can create your own situations then, right? Say, so I'm going to be a better material painter. I'm going to paint materials better. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, study a bunch of materials. I'm going to look at a lot of insight. And I'm going to pick one, and I'm going to stick with that one until I understand what they meant. Okay? And if I still can't understand it, then I'll just put it on the back burner and try something else. But at least I gave it a fair shot, right? Yeah. And then you do that, and then you can test that, right? You can say, okay, did I follow along and do that? No, okay, maybe I should have done it more accurately, like according to what they said, let me try it again. What if I, what if I try to mix it up a little bit, you know? What if instead I do what they suggest, I, like if they ask me to render a sphere, I try to render a cylinder following the same principles because they don't demonstrate how to paint a cylinder. But if I follow the same principles, will it still apply? Do you see what I'm getting at? You constantly put yourself in these quantifiable ways to challenge what you're learning, you know? Yeah. That way you can keep improving. Okay, a lot of people don't do this. Usually what people do is just look at a bunch of images and just copy and paste what they see. And then when they go and try to draw for themselves, they have no clue why they suck. You know, because there's no, they don't time themselves. They don't actually have an agenda when they're trying to study. You know, they just go for it, like go for broke. Um, and I'm not trying to say that that is not effective. It actually is pretty effective. It's, it's one of the best ways to improve, which is just brute force. Okay. It's one of the better ways. In fact, it's, 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 it's a, a suggestion I always tell people is like, if, if, if all else fails, like if you don't feel good about your studying, whatever, just fucking keep drawing, <laughs> you know, don't just, just don't stop. Cause even if you're not cognitively aware, your brain will be, your brain will be like, okay, what is this person up to? Why do they keep putting us through this grinder? You know, and your brain will literally be paying attention for you. Even if you're not actually paying attention, this is why you can have people who are extraordinary artists, but they can't teach you a damn thing. <laughs> yeah. You understand? It's not that they're bad artists. It's just that they actually don't know. Like their subconscious is driving so hard and so well, they actually generally don't know. And that doesn't make them a bad person if they can't explain it to you, right? Yeah. It, just, it just means that they weren't trained to explain it to you. Right? I am because I was 23 years old when I decided to become a good concept artist. I was already a, a, an adult, <laughs> you know? And so I was very aware of what I was learning. You understand? Yeah. I was really, I was all there. I was relatively there most of the time. <clears throat> and I experienced that my growth was more exponential because I was always on the, the fabric of thinking, I am a fraud. I don't actually know how to draw, <laughs> you know? And all these people do. So I need to really fucking figure this shit out. You understand? And, um, but my, my peers, they were artists in school and they were artists out of school. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so they were actually, because of that notion of like they were already good and they were big fish in a small pond kind of thing, you know? They, they actually held them back. They weren't able to be as critical as they needed to be. I was quantifying everything. I was like, I don't know how to paint metal. Okay, I had to learn how to paint metal. And I just sit there and learn how to paint metal, you know? And I, I used timers. Uh, I found timers to be the most effective. I used um, a trial and error, right? Scientific method. And I found that scientific method is probably the most effective. It's just basic experimentation until you understand it. Yeah. Right? And so um, another really good tool to practice is whenever you do study, 
right? One thing that you should consider doing is that once you study, um, do a test, a blind test or like a quiz, like a 10 minute, 15 minute quiz or test. Uh, because in, in grade school, we have that, right? And why? Why do we have like these tests? Well, to see if we know this, what the subject matter is, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> do you actually know um, two plus two equals four, right? Without looking at a piece of paper, without cheating, any of that. So the, the question can be the same with art, right? Like, do you know how to draw a human body proportionately accurate? You know? Mm-hmm. And if you do without reference, then yeah, you have some good clue. If you can't without reference, then uh, no, you don't. Go back to the drawing board. I had a student once that was great. Like uh, he he recognized his his how his question was kind of misguided. He was like, you know, I was doing those tests and those studies that you suggested me to do, you know, and it was really challenging, man. Like I just couldn't figure it out. Like every time I tested, it was really bad. And I was like, so what do you think that means? And he was like, that I didn't learn from my, oh, okay, yeah. I didn't study effectively. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's all the test is supposed to do. The tests aren't supposed to be easy. The tests are supposed to test your skill. Whether it's easy or not depends on how much you actually know, right? Yeah. That's all it's supposed to do. A test isn't supposed to be inherently easy or inherently hard. It's just, it's just supposed, it's supposed to just quantify your actual skill at that moment. You're studying materials. You tried to test it. You still don't know how to paint materials. So try again, study harder. You know, if you, if you did the test and you painted materials with flying colors, then move on. Let's move on to something else because you know how to paint materials. Okay. Yeah. And so um, these are the kinds of things that I think are important to, to try to keep in your mind as you work towards, um, supremacy in your artwork (laughs) yeah and i feel like possibly a more even kind of meta question to that is so if i want to put together a good portfolio and i'm thinking okay i want to work on my materials and maybe i'm already at a level where i kind of get materials and then something else is even more important for me to learn but i don't know of that because i'm not getting maybe like a lot of like professional criticism. I'm just going off of what I think I should know. But I'm just kind of curious, you know, because I heard it once said in one of my sculpting classes that it's like if you're making a character, if your anatomy isn't to like a medical uh, savant level, then that's not as important as like the bigger picture you're trying to say. Would you agree with that? So wait. You would have to have a bigger picture knowledge to be able to do better anatomy. Is that what your teacher was saying? No, I, you don't think, have to have a medical degree in anatomy. I think what he was saying was that, I, I guess my question is, um, should I just be, you know, striving to make things look as good as possible and comparing to other professionals or, or do I need to just like make a list of everything I think I need to know? that's reasonable of like to build a good portfolio, like anatomy materials, uh, gesture, and then just test myself on each of those levels and then apply what I learn. Or should I just, is there something that's the most important and then other things are subordinate? Yeah. So that's a, that's to piggyback off what I've been trying to answer. The answer to that question is yes. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> and you ask several different things and you're, you're posing different choices and the answer is yes. And what I mean by this is that all of those solutions seem pretty accurate. Okay. Like, should you be learning things that you feel like you should be improving upon? Like make a list and go down the list. Yes. Should you be comparing yourself to other professional artists and con- constantly gauging where you're, where you stand amongst them? Yes. Should you try to achieve really profound like expertise at certain things like anatomy, like a medical degree almost? Yeah. Should you pursue that? Yes. Is one more important than the other? 
I don't know. It all depends on where you're at. You understand? Yeah. And uh, I have a really good analogy for this. I'll share it with you right now. So what I've been doing here is actually been trying to frame this way of thinking about studying because people get this wrong a lot. Imagine that there's you and then there's me. This is you and then this is me, okay? Right. And there's a void in front of us. And in the void, you can see, you know, excellence in the stars, right? And you're like, oh man, but this void, I don't know where to start. You see several ways you can enter this void, okay? And you can see interconnecting stars. So you can see some connection to some of the excellence, but you don't really know where to begin, right? Yeah. It's this very incomplete picture. And then here's me, and I'm like, I'm trying to tell you, just go through one, don't worry about it. <laughs> right? And you're like, well, what if, which one's the best one? Because let's say I go through this one, AJ, and I want to go to this, this one right here. This is where I want to be. And what if I go to this one and it's like leads me to this and this and it doesn't seem like it's ever going to connect. I was like, no, just keep going. And then you, you go this way and you're like, I need to get to this one over here. Right. But it doesn't seem I can. And then you see this and you're like, ah, oh, see AJ, this would have been faster. Why don't you tell me to go to this one? Right. And that would have connected me fine. And I'm like, are you sure? Because then you realize that these aren't actually connected the way that you thought. And it goes over here. And it leads over there. And it's like this. And then this one might be a straight shot. <laughs> okay? And then this one's leading there. It's like this web. You get it? Yeah. This is really interlocked and complicated web. And what makes people have different styles is where they begin and the path that leads them to there. That's what makes people have these different styles. So that even though they live in the same, let's say, genre, right? The red line is someone else's path and the blue line is someone else's path. And they're no longer than any other one, right? But they end up both working at Blizzard on the Diablo team, let's say. You get what I'm saying? You get on yeah. one, uh, my point? Yeah. So for me to just say, oh yeah, just fucking follow the blue line would be disingenuous. Because I didn't even know I was following the blue line. You get it? Like, I didn't know, like, oh, yeah, I got, I'm on the right path, bro. I know every moment. Like, year two, going to be this. Year three, going to be this. Year four, <laughs> you know, like, I, I had, had no fucking clue, just like you did. But now I have hindsight because I've gone through it. I've met many, many other artists, and I've seen lots of different artists, you know? And I'm trying to give you that hindsight right now, which is don't worry about that. Just constantly study, time yourself, and uh, gauge where you're improving. That's what's going to make you get better personally. And it's also going to keep you focused. Because if you're constantly paying attention to other people's progression and other people's paths that they've taken, then it's actually a distraction to your own. Right? Yeah. Like, just because um, so-and-so uses... Um, this new software that just comes out doesn't mean I have to go and just start learning it, right? Mm -hmm. And just because no one's using the software doesn't mean I should never use it. You understand that principle that I'm trying to say? Yeah. Like, like you should just do it because you want to do it, okay? And whether you learn it quicker or not as quick, um, it doesn't matter if you keep moving forward. You hear what I'm saying? Like, as long as you keep pushing that that cart up the street, you know, you're going to get there. <clears throat> and so my advice usually when it comes to like, yeah, that kind of question that you were just asking, you know, what are like the best ways to improve and which one should I start with, right? Like, the, the best one is really just to do a test. Like, just do that 30-minute, 60-minute painting that I was suggesting earlier. Mm -hmm. Right? Just do it. And then once you've done it, take a look and see um, for yourself what you could have done 
um, to improve or what you didn't like about it. And then write it down and then go and study and practice it and try again. You can do this periodically too. You can do like every week. You can do like a bunch of studies and then you do like game time. You do like this large test to see where you're at. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but there, there's no, there's no really perfect path uh, other than consistent practice, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Consistent evaluation, honest evaluation, like not being distracted with everything that you see on art station. Yeah. You know, try to be consistent, you know? And then, um, and then, you know, always looking up to those who you admire that do the things that you would like to do, right? And then trying to see uh, if you can get closer to that. And I would say look at a variety of people, don't look at just one or two. Because remember that path analogy, right? Like that's how you lead to different paths. Because if you just go down the straight path that's one other artist done, then you're only going to draw like them. And the unfortunate truth is that they already exist. And they're already getting work, you know? Yeah. And most likely they already have like a, such a large head start on you and that kind of process and that kind of style, they're going to devastate you when they decide to kind of mix it with some other style. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause they understand the foundation of how to get that good. So hopefully that helps give you some advice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you have more questions. Yeah. I had yeah. A whole- I had a- yeah you have a couple more but let's like move on to someone else's sure. question just so that way we get be fair to others uh someone uh adrian asked about age was that you adrian i was just talking a minute ago or was that someone else that was someone else wasn't it i can answer the age one real quick and then the other person can can go i wasn't sure who just came out of the woodworks yeah that um, was me out of the woodworks. <laughs> okay yeah so let me answer adrian's real quick and then we'll answer yours so um uh, does age matter? No, it doesn't matter. Okay, next. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'll answer a little bit more fully. Um, put yourself in a position of an employer, okay? And someone comes in who's 35 or 36 years old, or maybe let's say they're 40 years old, and someone comes in and they're like 20 or 19, okay? The 40-year-old has the best portfolio in the business. They have a really great and outstanding portfolio. The 20-year-old has a mediocre portfolio. Who do you hire? You can hire the four-year-old, right? It's not a question about age. No one is like, well, wait, this person's work so good. Wait a minute, though. How old are they? Nobody does that. Uh, Sid Mead, he's like in his 80s, and he still works, okay? And um, uh, it, the, the reverse is true, right? Like if the, the, 20 was, the 20-year-old was pumping out some badass art that's some of the best in the industry and no one's have seen it before, uh, yeah, they would get a good shot at getting that job as well you see my point um the industry really is a very merit-based industry so you don't have to worry about that you know there might be concerns let's say if you're like a (laughs) five-year-old okay or if you're like a a, a hundred-year-old like you're about to die probably in a year you know then then maybe there's some then there's some concern uh, let me let me answer this real quick because my wife took my daughter to the hospital. Let me answer this real quick. But that's pretty much the answer. Give me one second. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, my my daughter uh, has strep throat, so that's not good. It's highly contagious, so we're gonna have to disinfect the whole house um, and quarantine her a little bit for a few days. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, that's my answer to that. I toured Valve. They said the youngest person to work for them was 14. And here I am, 25, and struggling to draw a person. <laughs> I asked because in Spain, it's one thing the employers look, the age, so they can see, for example, A, what did you do in this last two years when you finished your degree? For my example, I'm studying by my own anatomy and stuff. Okay. Yeah, and so... Uh, I don't know. I can't speak for Spain. So maybe there is a difference if you were to do it in Spain, but I would actually doubt that, that it would be that different because at the end of the day, if someone has a really outstanding portfolio, like work, that's really hard to ignore, you know what I mean? Like something that's just really, uh, extremely good. Um, yeah, you would want to know if they're 
they would have some sensibilities to them, some work ethic that would allow them to keep doing that, I'm sure. But my point is, is that um, usually companies will disregard that because if that person does really good work, that usually demonstrates that they're capable of keep continuously doing that good work. You know what I mean? So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Just focus on skill. Because if, you're, if, you're, if your ability to get a job is on the line of if you're old or young, then that probably means that your work isn't that impressive in, in the first place, right? So be very cautious. All right. Someone else have a question? I think they were going to say it, but then. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so my question is actually, my reason for being in the class is actually kind of different from everyone else, I'm guessing. Um, okay. I, started, I started my own drawing class last year. So I actually teach other artists as well. Cool. So being in here has like really helped me to become a better teacher. Trying to steal my teaching stress? Uh, taking notes. Gotcha. Taking notes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but I was just curious to find out. I don't know if you want to answer that here or, or yeah. somewhere else, but I was just curious to find out like what else I could be doing to get more students and to just continue becoming a better teacher. Yeah, so one of the biggest tools to be a good teacher is to sympathize with your students. Um, and empathize. So there's like, there's a few philosophies on how to get people better. And I can, I, I prescribe to both. Um, but I, there's statistically speaking, one definitely is more effective than the other, especially specifically teaching. And that is that the tough love strategy, right? Like just go, go in hard on people and really crush their dreams type of thing, you know? Mm. So there's that philosophy. And then there's another the one, which is like, you know, holding the people's hands and walking them through step by step how they can improve and between those two extremes the one of walking people through is one of the most effective uh, to create continual behavior right um, because the only way the other one works right like the tough love strategy is usually in in context of something traumatic happening to them Right, like if you lost a loved one and now you have to take care of like more, like all your siblings or something, right? That usually puts people into gear, usually, right? Um, yeah. But just yelling at somebody and telling them that they're a shithead usually doesn't, it's not nearly as effective. Like people usually drop out. There's a high dropout rate uh, in that regard, okay? Um, so, so this is, so going back to kind of my argument I made earlier about like, you know, people don't listen to the facts and opinions, uh, or that are held by those who hold these facts. Um, so for instance, I, I find myself more leaning center left, right? I, I believe in a lot of social programs. Um, and I believe in a lot of like helping those who are truly in need, you know, but I also am a big fan of meritocracy and civil liberties. Right, which is also a very is a very right position, but I mostly for social, uh, like working together as a team, like team, team effort, right, to help each other out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, with that being said, so in America we have this thing called affirmative action. Okay, and in affirmative action, do you know anything about affirmative action? Just a little bit. Okay, so some people don't really know that much about it, which is kind of weird, but it should should be known. Um, and for those of you, uh, and not from America, this might not be, this might be news to you. You don't know if this exists or not. So affirmative action was this idea of, look, there's these inner city black folk and minorities who are really have a shit life, right? They, they're born into these poor families and their communities are driven by gang violence, you know, and poverty. And so like, we need to get these kids out. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give them some extra help and boost to get them to really good schools that could forever better their life and then their family's lives after, right? So on paper, all this sounds great, okay? Uh, but what they were doing, and in California, they banned it, actually. They banned this 
the strategy of affirmative action because it just isn't effective. And it's actually, it's actually the opposite of what they wanted. It's actually very racist, um, which is that, okay, so if you're black, we're going to give you, you know, more access to student loans. We're going to give you um, uh, higher points on your SATs and your test scores. So that way you can get access to these, these better schools. Okay. So again, on the surface, you're like, okay, well, that makes sense, right? Like these, these kids really had bad luck. I mean, it's not their fault that they were born in a, with a single uh, mother household uh, who works three jobs, live in a gang community, have really poor, you know, living circumstances, right? Uh, the school that they went to wasn't the best, you know, and they, they made do with what they got, right? They're trying, you know, and who are we to hold them back just because of a few points, okay? All of this makes sense. You know, I get it. And uh, if you wouldn't have told me the data, then I would have, I would have been in favor of these types of strategies, right? But the data says the opposite. There's a high dropout rate in African uh, college students, right? Especially those who went through the affirmative action, right? And what they've done too, because they were trying to get more minority, specifically black and brown people, the Asian communities were devastating these canvases. They were overwhelmingly taken over because they were extremely, extremely skilled in doing, taking these tests and getting through with flying colors. So what they ended up doing was making it harder for Asians to get into these schools. This is, this is like a, it's still ongoing. It's pretty crazy. Okay. So now if you're, if you're Asian, we're, we're going to take some points off and we're going to make student loans harder. harder to access. To so what am I, what am I saying here? Is that when you put people through this, because what happens is these kids go to these schools and they're not prepared and everything is extremely overwhelming. That's what happens. Okay. It's not that they're stupid. It's not that they don't deserve to have a chance. It's that they're just not skilled. It's like putting a, a rabbit a, in a race against cheetahs. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Maybe the rabbit was able to outrun those mice in their community. Right. But they're not keeping up with these motherfucking cheetahs. You see my point? And so as you probably notice in my class and you'll see towards the end, most of you, if not all of you will keep submitting homework and keep progressing. Because instead of saying, hey, you guys should stay up to the standards of this student who's the best, I say, this is what you should do because this is where you are at. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Because if I, if I had a grade system that would create unnecessary competition, right? If I had like a, a reward system, again, that would create unnecessary competition. The only reward that I should be giving you is the reward of demonstrating that you can progress on your own. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. And uh, I think this is not just an affirmative action problem. This is a problem in just general in most educational platforms, right? It was just compounded with the affirmative action, which is I strongly disagree with. I had a strong argument with my friend about this, who's highly liberal, right? I was like, but the data says it's the opposite, bro. I am with the conservatives on this one, <laughs> okay? And it's interesting because I'm half black and half Korean. So like, <laughs> so in my own mind, right? Like the black side, yeah, give us a fucking chance. And then the, the Korean side, what? Why the <laughs> fuck do you get to go? <laughs> if I got the test scores, then why can't I get in? Why do I have to try harder than you? You know? Because mm. if we were just to leave it to its own devices, right? If we were just to leave it alone and not give anyone else extra help, like specifically at that end, right? Um, yeah, a lot of these college campuses would be even more overwhelmed with Asian students, okay? And these schools want to push diversity, but the reality is, what if that's just how it is, you know? And, um, like, it's, it's, I get it, but it's like you don't want to hold back some people just because you want to fill a, a diverse quota, right? And it's actually damaging to those who uh, go to these communities or go to these colleges and fail miserably because then they Cause really they believe that they weren't capable, Right, which is actually a complete lie. They were going to Harvard. They're already fucking great. Maybe they just should have went to, you know, Yale. I don't know which one's the more subordinate school. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. they shouldn't have gone to Harvard. They should have went to the one down below. They would have done just as fine. They could have easily become an engineer or, or a doctor or whatever they wanted to do instead of just being a college dropout and then 
working at McDonald's and going back to their communities, you know? Mm -hmm. You solve these problems sooner. You don't solve them later. You solve them by getting them good access to these programs and schools so that they can actually progress at the rate that they're at. You know, they're just at a disadvantage and you have to catch them at that disadvantage and you have to meet them at that disadvantage. And I know this firsthand because I have a son who has a learning disability and his, uh, he's my stepson and his father kept on putting him in regular classes saying my son is capable of keeping up with these kids, right? But he just wasn't. And all the teachers were just letting him get through because they're, old, because they're fucking lazy and they didn't give a fuck. And they're like, oh yeah, he's, you know, he's reading at a fourth grade level. And when he finally went to the schools that we were able to get him to, these really good schools where they were able to actually gauge his actual skill and his actual ability, they're like, no, he's reading at a first grade level. They've all been lying, you know? Wow. And I'm like, that's, and that's why he's been held back. Not because he's like literally being held back. It's because they kept on putting him at classes that are way beyond his ability to keep up, you know? That whole uh, keeping up like a rabbit versus a cheetah analogy came from one of the teachers at this good school. And when she told me that, I was like, fuck, that makes perfect sense, you know? And uh, guess what happened? Now that they put him at the level that he should be at, he's improving dramatically. Because it's not so freaking dangerously overwhelming. Hold on, it's my wife again. Give me one second, sorry. This is important. Give me one second. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to have to go downstairs real quick to help my wife with the, my daughter. Um, yeah, Eric said he wanted to chime in. Yeah, go ahead and chime in before, but, but before we, before we let you chime in, um, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, when you want, when you're teaching your students, pay attention to their weaknesses. And if you see them procrastinating or you start to see them not to do as much as you would like, it, it almost has nothing to do with them, uh, on a very personal level. It's usually maybe the work that you gave them was too hard. And mm. because it was overwhelming, they just, the easier route is just to, to not do it or make up excuses. Mm. And so you have to find ways to, to teach them um, that it's fine. Like, it's okay. It's okay to have excuses. It's okay to have reasons. And see where you can get them to do homework that actually matches their actual skill level. Because everyone in your class is never going to be at the same level. It's just unlikely. This is statistically just unlikely to happen. You know, yeah. Even if it's like an advanced class with a portfolio review, like everyone has different things. Some people have full time jobs. Some people have kids. Some people are older. Some people are younger. You know what I mean? If you treat everyone the same, you're only going to get those who actually are catering, or you're only going to cater to those who actually um, like that. Your whatever your your curriculum is is only going to cater to those it's most effective. So if you create a system that is catering to all and effective, like that pays attention to all people's abilities, then you're going to do better as a teacher overall. Um, but yeah, if you follow like the strict curriculum that most of these standardized schools do, yeah, don't, don't be surprised. You're going to have a lot of fallouts of students dropping your classes. Uh, I've already experienced it when I used to teach in industry, like in a, in the universities. Mm. It was crazy. Like I was like, what the hell? And then when I teach my classes online, I almost never get as much. Maybe one or two people might fall off the bandwagon, but usually everyone stays in. Um, but anyways, Eric, you had something to say? You guys are more, more than welcome to talk whenever. No big deal. All right, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess another question I have is, uh, how would you recommend getting like consistent feedback maybe like you know maybe once this class is over or just feedback that's relevant to your goals so if you want to work at a certain company um short of like being able to contact the people who would be hiring at that company like how do we gauge whether we're really like building something that they would value i see that's a good question and i actually do want to answer that but we'll take like a really quick break again because i have to go down and help my wife so we'll okay. pick up from that question. I'll answer that question and then I'll, I'll send you guys out in the weekend. Uh, so we'll be, that'll be the last question as well. Um, so I'll try to answer right now, but I have a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So give me one second. I'll be right back. All right. What, what was the, the question again? I, I slipped my mind. Yeah, it was uh, how can we gauge whether our efforts are, will be, um, how do we know if the company we want to work for is going to like our stuff, basically? 
Oh, okay. So <laughs> it's actually an easier answer. I could probably have answered it earlier. <laughs> um, so the best way to think about that, oh, yeah. I don't want, no, it's okay. I don't want it to fall on me. It's not a, it's all right if it makes a little noise. It's not a big deal. Sorry, the little, little ones running around. Um, so one of the, the, the best ways to do this is to just look at the kind of stuff that they have uh, on their portfolio. Like think of the games that they make and stuff, you know? Yeah. And actually just look at it. There's, there's really no reason to speculate. You understand? Like, um, oh, wait, hold on. I just realized something. Um, yeah, there's no reason to speculate. Like, if you're going to work on like Blizzard, then look at Blizzard games, you know? Um, because you can get a good clue of what they would want, you know what I mean? Yeah, so and and then you just look at the artists who work there and then you just try to compare your work to theirs. Um, a really good way of thinking about this is when you walk through those doors to work for that company, there shouldn't they shouldn't have to teach you how to do what they do. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I think you talked about this the first class. Yeah. So like if you were going to work on, let's say Mega Man, like a new Mega Man game, like this version right here, do you have anything in your portfolio that demonstrates you can do this? Yes or no? Yeah. Like I'm asking you, do you? Do you no. have anything? No. So then that's probably why you're not going to work there. Not because you're bad or anything. You just, I don't have one either, you know? And, um, and if you just look at like, you know, Riot Games Splash, like people definitely want to do this, right? They're really interested in doing this type of stuff. You know, don't look at the lowest common denominator too. Don't look at like some old stuff that they've done. Like look at the great latest and greatest, you know? Cause that just means that's the, like the, the most recent skilled artists that they have working for them. You know what I mean? So you look at something like this and you ask yourself, do I have something of the skill level or quality? And if the answer is no, then don't be surprised that they're going to turn you down. If the answer is yes, then now it's just a question that they actually know you exist. Okay which is a whole different thing, which is like a, like networking and spreading your work out there. But if you just want to know if you're even just capable of working, well, does your stuff even come close to the skill that they would require right out of the gate? Does okay. it make sense? Yeah. Uh, and that's what I did when I first started. I was like always looking at artists that um, worked for those companies and see the kind of skill that they had. And I try to just attain the same amount of skill. Oh, and then when I worked, sorry, working for some of these companies it became apparent that that is true. Like they're looking for people that can just walk in those doors and start to get to work, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Like they don't want to have to like teach you how to like paint, <laughs> like in their style. Like if they, that's like, that's your job is to figure that out so that when they look at your portfolio, they know that you know what they're up to. Yeah. And, uh, Another quick little question, and it's kind of not related, but um, if someone's colorblind, is that like a real problem or as long as they see values and they're good with that? Yeah, values, values are, is all you really need. Having a good sense of color is not that valuable unless you're like the color key artist and maybe, <laughs> yeah. you know, but just to be a concept artist, no, not at all. It's not that important. Um, <clears throat> because if you look at this painting that I did, like I can easily just change <coughs> the color of it and it would read still pretty cool because it's all about the values you know what i mean yeah that's what i thought but i was just kind of curious what your perspective was yeah i don't think that i've ever worked somewhere where they're like we don't hire colorblind people we want we want only the best um and plus there's like these new glasses that make certain color blindness like it, it, it corrects for that which is cool. But again, even without them, I think you're fine. <laughs> I have friends who are colorblind and they work in the industry and they're fine. Okay. So yeah, if, if you're colorblind, you just can't be an astronaut or a pilot. <laughs> and maybe there's some other jobs that are, that really require you to have a good sensorial perception of the world when it comes to visible, visible light. Right. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you don't like, it, it seems like you would need to be able to see, colors and stuff to be a good artist but uh, technically you don't 
Uh, I do like some of my most popular paintings are black and white. So I'm just saying, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's what my, uh, that's what my color teacher said. And it's just it's mainly about values. Yeah. Uh, values is what's really driving the show. Totally. All right. I'm going to have to go now. I'm going to try to help my wife get this under control. We're like quarantine in the house right now. Uh, if it's a short answer, could you please also quickly say what do you think about the art pens for Wacom tablets? I know it's not the tool that makes the artist, but just wanted to hear your opinion. Um, it's not the tool that makes the artist. All right. See you guys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, uh, I honestly uh, haven't tried it enough to have a fair opinion, um, but I'm happy with just the regular one. So, I, yeah, I've only t- tried it one time and I thought it was cool, but I didn't. It wasn't cool enough for me to be like, damn, I need this right away. Um, but it wasn't like so awful that I'm like, this is garbage. I have no idea if it's good or awful. I haven't had enough time with it. So that's my opinion on that. Anyways, I got to go though. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. Appreciate you. Today is lucky because usually I have to run and go get my class anyway, like or my uh, daughter from school. But um, because she didn't go to school today, it was easier to just kind of bleed the class a little longer to answer some of these questions. But anyways. Peace out, friends. Have a great, 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 great weekend. Talk to you guys real soon. Laters. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.